Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. We will be starting in just a few moments. Uh, we will start with our California land acknowledgement, our breath, and our interruption practices to give folks a time, some time to come on in. We want to acknowledge that we gather as the California Faculty Association on the traditional land of the indigenous people past and present and honor with gratitude the land itself and the people who have stewarded it throughout the generations. This calls us to commit to continuing to learn how to be better stewards of the land we inhabit as well. To recognize the land is an expression of gratitude and appreciation to those whose territory we reside on and a way of honoring the indigenous people who have been living and working on the land from time immemorial. It is important to understand the long standing history that has brought us to reside on the land and to seek to understand our place within the history. Land acknowledgements do not exist in a past tense or historical context. Colonialism is a current ongoing process and we need to build our mindfulness of our present participation. Acknowledging the land is an important indigenous protocol that we are honoring here today. We also recognize and acknowledge the labor upon which our country, state and institution are built. We remember that our country was built on the labor of enslaved people who were kidnapped and brought to the US from the African continent and recognize the continued contribution of their survivors. We also acknowledge all immigrant and indigenous labor, including voluntary, involuntary, trafficked, forced, and undocumented peoples who contributed to the building of the country and continue to serve within our labor force. We recognize that our country is continuously defined, supported, and built upon by oppressed communities and peoples. We acknowledge labor inequities and the shared responsibility for combating oppressive systems in our daily work. Let us take some time now for our breath. You can either focus on a specific spot or close your eyes. When I'm spinning swirl of leaves, I tell myself to breathe. Breathe in, breathe out. I draw sweet air deeply and long, as pure as prayer, as sweet as song, where lilies glow and roses wreath, heart joy I know to just breathe. Breathe in and out. I so I think by shore or sea, as deep I drink of purity. This brave machine bare to the buff, I keep ice clean. Breath is enough. Breathe in, in and out. From mountain stream to covert cool, the world I dream is wonderful. The great, the small, the smooth, the rough, I love it all. Breath is enough. As part of our continuing commitment to racial justice work, when we experience examples of racial narratives, racism or whiteness in our meetings, or as we conduct our business, we will speak up. This means we can interrupt the meeting and draw the issue to one another's attention. We will do this kindly, with care and in good faith, Further, as we engage interruptions, we take an intersectional approach, reflecting the fact that white supremacy and racism operate in tandem with interlocking systems of oppression and colonialism, class, cis hatred, patriarchy, and ableism. This statement is a reminder that we commit to do this in the service of ending the system of racial oppression. As such, I would like to describe myself. I am a light-skinned black woman from Jamaica with hair that's braided and pulled back behind my neck in a black turtleneck 
with very red lips. I would like to go ahead now and introduce our speaker, Dr. Diane Fugino. Dr. Diane Fugino is a professor of Asian American Studies at UC Santa Barbara and co-editor-in-chief of the Journal of Asian American Studies. Her research examines Japanese and Asian American activist history within an Asian American radical tradition and shaped by Black power and third world decolonization. As director of the Center for Black Studies Research until 2018, Dr. Fugino initiated an engaged scholarship program working within the Black radical tradition. She's featured in Aoki, a documentary film, and in multiple media outlets, speaking on the history of Asian American, Afro-Asian, and third world liberation struggles. She has written and co-edited several books on Asian American and Black power activism, including Contemporary Asian American Activism, Building Movements for Liberation, Black Power, Alter Afterlives, The Enduring Significance of the Black Panther Party, and Heartbeat of Struggle, The Revolutionary Life of Yuri Kochiyama. She has also co-edited a special issue of Ameri Asia Journal on Asian American Activism Studies. She's a core organizer of the Ethnic Studies Now Santa Barbara Coalition, ESNSB, and is a co-author of an article examining the organizing model of ENS, ESNSB. Dr. Fugino serves on the boards of the UC Santa Barbara Multicultural Center, the Intersectional Justice Facilitator Program, and the Food Security and Basic Needs Task Force. She's a board member of the Fund for Santa Barbara and formerly with La Casa de la Raza. She is a founding member of Corporation Santa Barbara, serves on the Bloom Center's Corporative Economics Advisory Committee, and is on the steering committee of the Regional Equity Study. We are so honored to have Dr. Fujino with us. Welcome. Thank you so much, Dr. Shelley, for that really warm welcome. And I love the beautiful um, poem on breathing. I, I'm Diane Fugino. I speak from Santa Barbara, the unceded lands and waters of the Chumash peoples. Um, I am going to describe myself, right, which is that I'm an Asian woman with glasses and I'm wearing headphones and a microphone. And I really want to thank all of the organizers who worked so hard to put this together. I know because I do that kind of organizing work and it's always so much harder than those who are in front of the cameras. Um, I am going to Go ahead and screen share my PowerPoint. Oops. Okay, can everybody see this? Is that right? Okay, great. So I am here to speak about Afro-Asian solidarities, primarily as well as third world solidarities. And I gave it the subtitle of Building Movements for Liberation, because I think that's ultimately what we are trying to do here. And I'm, um, you know, put up images of solidarity, Asians extending solidarity for Black liberation, and also Black folks extending liberation, I mean, extending solidarity for Asian liberation. And in the context of so much recognition of Afro-Asian conflict and race conflicts. I'm really pleased to be able to speak about solidarities um, and to speak also about Asian American activism, which is so invisibilized. So what I'm going to be doing is three, speaking in three parts. One is to talk, kind of set up how we got to this place of thinking about differential racializations of Asians and Blacks Afro-Asian conflict and the ways that Asian Americans and Blacks have been pitted against each other. And I'm gonna put that in a historic context. The second thing I wanna do is to give two examples of Asian Black solidarities. And then I wanna talk about four principles of solidarity as I see it. Um, so starting first with this idea of differential racialization and thinking about racism as being structural. So 
you know, to think about how we got to this place, right? And people think of racialization as the process of ascribing ethnic or racial identities to groups or social practices that didn't previously identify as such, particularly for the purpose of domination. It's also a process by which social meanings are attributed to different racialized groups. These racializations can change over time as I'm going to be talking about with respect to Asian Americans. And another really important point is that they are relational. So Natalia Molina writes really important works on this idea of relational race, what others call comparative race, but she's shifting it a little bit. And this is the idea that material conditions and representations of one group emerge in direct relationship to another. They're shaped in relationship to others. And I'm going to, I think it's going to become clearer as I go on in this, in this um, talk today. So for Asian Americans, right, the, the primary um, racialization or, or representation is that of being the model minority the group that despite having faced discrimination or racism has managed to um, gain upward mobility. It's used to show that the system in this society is open and anyone can make it. And it uh, minimizes or erases uh, the structural racism, the kinds of institutional barriers, laws, practices that have created so much inequity, um, structural inequity, historical racism, and, and systems of domination and subordination. So we know that racialization of Asian Americans have shifted, and I'm just going to go over this quickly. If you see on the left, these were the typical kinds of images that existed of, of Japanese Americans during World War II and before as well. Um, from the 1800s until the early 1940s. And Japanese Americans and Asian Americans were seen as yellow peril threats who were dangerous and going to invade and take over um, the, the nation state, the US. Immediately after World War II, these representations shifted dramatically, rather surprisingly, right? Going from the concentration camps into model citizenship. And these kinds of tropes have been talked about and written about um, fairly extensively. And I wanna say that they started in the immediate aftermath of World War II. So in 1946, this image of right here of President Truman awarding the Presidential Distinguished Unit Citation to the all Japanese American 442 Regimental Combat Team the most decorated unit of its size in military history, meaning that it experienced the most casualties and most deaths uh, in relation to its size. And at this moment in 1946, right a year after the ending of World War II, um, President Roosevelt tells the Japanese American soldiers, you fought not only the enemy, but you fought prejudice and you have won. The Japanese American community, the elites of the community did what many other groups have done before them and used the demonstration of battlefield bravery and sacrifice to show that we are citizen worthy, right? We, we, we are worthy of US citizenship and to gain better treatment. And this statement by President um, Truman, right? You fought not only the enemy, but you fought prejudice and you have won, speaks to an imaginary of an elimination of prejudice. And that is what happens with the model minority. It is used to try to convey this elimination of prejudice. It is true that images, uh, let's see, how do I get rid of this? It is true that um, Representations of Japanese Americans changed dramatically. So for example, in the Saturday Evening Post in 1955, there was an article called California's Amazing Japanese. Such a difference from what had happened during World War II. And Japanese Americans faced increased opportunities to move into the suburbs, to get jobs equivalent to their college educations, which was completely different than what happened before World War II. 
I think what's most important to understand about this is that these kinds of tropes turning Asian Americans and Japanese Americans into model citizens becomes read as the triumph of the nation and a correction of its past wrongs, including the incarceration of Japanese Americans. And what's also really crucial is that we don't just limit this to a domestic context, but we think of this as part of a, a, a global context. And what was happening, why, why this image suddenly emerges, why it unexpectedly is such a dramatic transformation from just a year earlier, um, is that at this moment, when the US rises to global world power in the aftermath of World War II, it is trying to do a contradictory thing. It wants to expand into Asia and the Pacific and to control those regions um, economically and politically while also um, uh, positioning itself, right? Portraying itself as the premier model of democracy and freedom in the world. It wants to distance itself from old world colonialism and all of its terrors to show that it is really promoting freedom and democracy as it expands and has imperial ambitions in Asia and, um, and the Pacific. And so it's really productive and this is part of the importance of the model minority to show a reduction of anti-Asian racism in this period. The model minority log image and logic becomes popularized in 1966. This is the period of the mid 60s when we think about the model minority emerging for Asian Americans. But as I've already said that this really happens in an earlier period and it's linked to global expansionism. But in the 1960s, um, there are two magazine articles, popular, respected, widely read, right? The New York Times Magazine and the US News and World Report. And they use these success story tropes of Japanese Americans and Chinese Americans to try to make arguments of how this group has managed despite discrimination to succeed, to gain upward mobility in the United States. And as I teach, what else happened in 1966, right? The civil rights movement took a turn to black power. Now, of course, ideas of black power, of self-determination, of critiques of power, of asking for something more than a piece of the pie, of asking for something beyond integration, um, all those ideas didn't just emerge in 1966, they emerged earlier. Um, but 1966 was a really important marker for this. In that year, Stokely Carmichael, the later Kwame Ture, calls for black power in Greenwood, Mississippi in June of 66. And in October of 1966, the Black, power, uh, the black Panther Party forms in Oakland. And so in this way, if you juxtapose these two, right, you see that this is a relational, um, formation. Popularizing Asian Americans as model minorities happens at a particular moment, and it has a particular impact. And so some of what happens when you take a relational or comparative racial analysis is you see that um, there's a lot that happens, right? Um, for one, is my second point, the model minority disciplines Black militancy and protest in general. It shows that dissent, it's trying it to articulate or it's trying to align with the idea that dissent isn't necessary. You can work through the system, through education, through hard work, and you don't need to resort to protest. Two, I mean, a second thing is it hides problems within Asian America itself and it erases anti-Asian racism. This is partly why people know so little about anti-Asian, I mean, about Asian American activism and didn't know a lot about the problems happening, including anti-Asian violence until the COVID moment. A third thing is it undercuts solidarity and people who would be naturally connected to support one another in the ways that are necessary to gain liberation. And the fourth point that I wanna make, which is really crucial, is that it redeems the nation, right? As a liberal democracy committed to equality and justice. 
And so, as we'll see, Asian Americans have rejected this idea of the model minority and instead stood in solidarity with other groups. And we have a very long history of building Afro-Asian solidarity. Um, and I just give a few examples. Um, we have Frederick Douglass, right? The most renowned a formidable abolitionist who spoke in opposition to the exclusion of Chinese Americans, culminating in the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. U.S. Black soldiers fought in, who, who fought, went overseas in the U.S. Philippine War in the late 1800s. Um, some of them switched sides and fought in solidarity with Filipinos who they felt were fighting for self-determination in their own lands. And really crucial to thinking about Afro-Asian Solidarities is the Asian African Conference that takes place in Bandung, Indonesia in 1955. This conference, right, in the aftermath of World War II, many um, colonial nations fought off formal colonialism and gained their formal independence. And they, 29 nations met in Indonesia and they were meant to forge a common unity against racism, against world racism, uh, for world peace, and against colonialism in all its forms, because they recognized that throwing off formal colonialism didn't end colonialism. And as Kwame Ture talked about, there is such a thing as neocolonialism and other forms of, say, political and economic control even in the absence of direct territorial control. I wanna um, talk about two examples of Afro-Asian solidarities. One is little known, um, the Nisei progressives. And I'm basing, I'm going to focus a little bit more on Japanese Americans than other groups in part because this stems from my own research, but I'm also taking care to make sure that I don't that we're not just privileging East Asians in this kind of discussion. But one of the groups is Nisei progressives, um, Nisei being second generation Japanese Americans, the children of immigrants. And this group forms in the late 1940s. And they first form as a Nisei for Wallace group in support of Henry Wallace's third party campaign for the presidency on the progressive party platform. And this is a picture of them, um, it, you know, it, with, with Henry Wallace in, in the middle. And after Wallace, um, you know, loses, they turn into a more a longstanding organization called the Nisei Progressives. And one of the things that they do is they, um, they, they work for and critique the McCarran-Walter Act. This is an act that um, others were in favor of. They, you know, it, it granted uh, citizenship to Japanese Americans, which was really important. So it ended the exclusion of Japanese Americans as, quote, aliens ineligible for citizenship that was written into the 1924 Immigration Act. It granted naturalized citizenship to Japanese Americans. And by overturning that status of quote unquote, aliens ineligible for citizenship, it overturned hundreds of discriminatory laws against Japanese Americans. Um, Japanese American groups like the moderate Japanese American Citizens League really fought uh, tirelessly for this, um, in favor of it. Um, and the Nisei progressives, of course, wanted citizenship for Japanese American immigrants for their parents. But this law also had really problematic provisions. And the Nisei progressives, to their credit, raised these kinds of problems, allied with labor and left groups, um, and voted and, and advocated against the McCarran-Walter Act even though it granted such important um, uh, uh, provisions for their own parents and for Japanese immigrants. Part of what the McCarran-Walter Act did was it increased and reinforced racism in immigration law. It restricted immigration of West Indian or Black immigration from what was nearly unlimited under uh, British 
huge 65,000 um, quotas to 100 a year. It deported, it, it had a provision that could increase the deportation and denaturalization of leftist immigrants. And it discriminated against Asians themselves. Only Asians were counted as, by ancestry, not national origins, such that say a Japanese from Brazil would be counted in Japan's small quotas and not gain access through Western Hemisphere non-quota access. And in addition, the McCarran-Walter Act gave really in unequal quotas, as big as 65,000 to Britain and 100 to most other countries. So for these reasons, the Nisei progressives oppose the McCarran-Walter Act despite its benefits to its own community. The Japanese American Citizens League, which I said fought tirelessly for this, um, made the argument that it was important to reduce discrimination, right? And, and we want to gain immigration rights. And this is what one of their foremost leaders, Mike Masaoka wrote in a Washington Post um, letter. He said, legislation of this nature is a step-by-step -step proposition. And we believe that to people who have absolutely nothing in the way of immigration privileges, half a loaf is infinitely preferable to the promise of a full loaf to come in some distant future. I mean, this is reasonable, right? I mean, this is how organizing and change happens. It doesn't happen all at once. But the Nisei progressives had a different view. And theirs was based on the premise that the McCarran-Walter Act was racist in, in, in intent and effects. And they said this, this is the price we must pay for our half a loaf. And this is the price we would force so many others to pay for our half a loaf. So they were saying that <clears throat> this in fact was really a compromised piece of legislation for others as well as for themselves. <clears throat> We are being offered naturalization and immigration rights in exchange for discriminatory double standards for Negro and Oriental peoples. We who want equal rights in the fullest sense cannot submit to racist and opportunistic principles. I call this deep solidarities, what the, as a demonstration of deep solidarities, right? Accompanying a targeted group in ways that demands a risk or sacrifice of one's direct self-interest, the refusal to accept rights for one's group at the expense or diminishing of equality and liberation for others. And this is a rejection of the model minority trope and logic. Okay. A second example that I give is of the Asian American Political Alliance come, moving up to the late 1960s. And this is the group that actually originated the Asian American movement of the late 60s. APA starts in May of 1968 at UC Berkeley. And for those who know Asian American history, Asian American studies, Asian American movement history, this is the group that actually coined the term Asian American. And they did this not to try to say that there were any kinds of cultural or social similarities among uh, at the, the, the three largest groups at the time, Chinese, Japanese, and Filipinos. Japan had, it, had right militarily invaded China and the Philippines and Vietnam. There was much hatred and conflict among the groups. But they said that because racism operates on a group basis, we, with such small numbers, need to come together and unify in opposition to racism, and also because we're treated as interchangeable as all looking alike. In APA's um, conceptualization of this term, it was both a pan-Asian term, right, to unite Japanese, Chinese, Filipinos, and other Koreans in the ways that I just mentioned. It was also inherently third-worldist from the beginning. 
Um, if you look at the second to the last paragraph on the right, if you can read it, it says, we Asian Americans support all oppressed peoples and their struggles for liberation and believe that third world people must have complete control over the political, economic, and educational institutions within their communities. And they did much to show this type of third world solidarity. And one of the most famous things that they did, <clears throat> or well, what they're most known for, because these images are iconic, especially the one on the far right, uh, far left, um, support for the Black Panther Party co-founder Huey Newton when he was arrested, right? So you see Free Huey, you see Yellow Peril supports Black Power, uh, and so forth, these, these types of images. Um, but I want to say it wasn't only one directional. It wasn't just Asian American solidarity extended to Black liberation. Black uh, activists also extended solidarity to Asian American liberation. And one example that I give is the Black Panther Party in May of 67, right, half a year after they form, um, we know that in their 10 point platform, point number seven to stop police violence in black communities was the one that the community um, saw as the most important. And so the Panthers, you know, Huey Newton went to the law library, right? Found that you could have open carry guns in this way. And um, they followed the patrol, the police, right? As they went into Oakland and other black communities. And rather than just standing and observing, right? Or, you know, as people do, they stood and observed with guns. And what they said was that this was not to try to, you know, engage in any type of military confrontation, which they knew that they would lose, but that this was a, a statement to stop the violence in Black, the state violence, right? The police violence in Black communities. And as a result of their successes, <clears throat> Mulford introduced a bill that would repeal this public carrying of guns and undercut the Black Panther Party's police patrol. The Black Panthers go to Sacramento. They do a big demonstration. This is a picture of that demonstration. Huey Newton writes a speech that Bobby Seale, the other co-founder, reads. And part of that speech is an enactment of Afro-Asian solidarities. It's more, it also connects to indigenous land theft but it links black oppression and the enslavement of Africans with the atomic bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, with the incarceration of Japanese Americans and with the war in Vietnam. Um, in fact, when Richard Aoki attended his first Black Panther Party meeting, um, he was asked to speak about the concentration camps. And this was well before people were speaking about this in political ways. Um, I want to get to my four principles for Afro-Asian solidarity or solidarity in general. One is this call for solidarity, not allyship. This matches exactly the theme of this conference. So I know you all know it, but I just want to say this. Um, Sung Young Chimaro, um, published an article in Color Lines, and this was shortly after George Floyd incident, right? This was June of 2020 that this gets published, in which she calls for this solidarity, not allyship, a call for the Asian American API community. And in this, you know, allyship, as you know, is a process whereby people extend support from one group to another. Often it means a more privileged group extends support one way to another. It can involve kind of ideas of charity in a negative way, right? Of colonial relations, of, of reproducing that. Um, and what um, Chimaro says is that Asian Americans are impacted by racism and we shouldn't take on this idea of being allies, like white allies. And instead, we should engage as partners, as equal partners in liberation and justice movements. Um, and Soya Jung also commits to this by talking about model minority mutiny, um, giving up our associated privileges, 
recognizing that, as Yuri Kochiyama always talked about, our liberation is interconnected. And as Soya Jung wrote, our liberation depends on Black freedom. So I'm going to um, say something about Yuri Kochiyama, who people might know as the person who, uh, Japanese American in Harlem, who worked with Malcolm X and some of the most uh, militant Black um, organizations in Harlem, including she was a member of the Republic of New Africa. And when Malcolm X was assassinated, she was um, in the audience. Everyone ducked when the gunshots went off. And then she saw somebody run up onto stage and she went to try to offer comfort. And Life Magazine, you see this picture of her um, trying to offer some comfort to Malcolm X. And um, interestingly, right, in the ways that Black uh, revolutionary nationalism and internationalism was portrayed and the way that Malcolm X was demonized at that time and seen as a, a, a race separatist or a black devil as he was called. There was no mention, there was not even a questioning in Life Magazine of why an Asian American woman was in the audience that day. Um, but I wanna say that how did Yuri Kochiyama fit into the black movement? The people that I've talked to, I mean, certainly some saw her, she should, didn't have a role there. But the people that I've talked to over and over again said, Yuri showed up, she was present, she went to all the meetings, she worked harder than anyone to support prisoners, when, um, political prisoners when they came out of prison and getting people to write to them and make sure that they knew that they weren't alone inside prison. And so she worked in a, in a method of accompaniment, in a method in which she built relationships with people. She showed up. It wasn't a one-time thing. It wasn't occasional. She wasn't inconsistent. And this is some of the elements of solidarity that are so crucial. And the second thing I want to say about Yuri Kochiyama is that she wasn't just engaged in something light. It was rooted in an opposition, this was her solidarity, was rooted in an opposition to racism, imperialism, capitalism, what we might call today, you know, after Cedric Robinson, racial capitalism. Um, and that formed the alliance that she had with uh, these black uh, liberation groups. My, my, I wanna give another example of this type of deep solidarity. Um, an Afro-Asian solidarity and um, solidarity, not allyship. So Dr. King, right, well, best known for his 1965 March on Washington, I Have a Dream speech, um, gave other speeches and grew in his ideas. And by April of 1967, he delivers one of his most important speeches at Riverside Church in New York City. And it's a really difficult one. He didn't want to speak out against the Vietnam War because he knew that it would engage the wrath of so many, including his civil rights cohorts, who thought that that would detract from the domestic civil rights movement. Um, the U.S. government didn't want him to link, you know, war, militarism, imperialism with U.S. domestic race issues. Um, black power activists were angry with Dr. King, feeling that he was too moderate and too slow to speak out against the Vietnam War. And he decides that it is a time to break silence. And he gives this speech. And it's a really hard one. You can listen to it and you can hear the tension in his voice. But he said that my conscience leaves me no other choice and that it is time to speak out against the Vietnam War. Um, and one of the things he talks about is the ways that he's been telling his people in the ghettos that Molotov cocktails will not solve their problems. And they ask, what about Vietnam? What lessons come from our own nation when our own nation uses massive doses of violence to solve its problems? So he felt he had to speak out. He was also incensed in the ways that the U.S. government in this war in Vietnam was so arrogant and condescending in, think, in, in arguing that the people of Vietnam were not ready for independence. As Black people, they had heard this so often. And Dr. King in this speech also humanizes the Vietnamese people. 
at a time when the U.S. was at war with Vietnam, right? The Vietnamese were in the mainstream seen as the enemy. And he says, I speak as a child of God and brother to the suffering poor of Vietnam. And his connections with Vietnam just didn't happen in broad strokes. It wasn't simply a statement against the Vietnam War, which it was. He was also highly influenced by a particular person, Thich Nhat Quan, who was a monk, a Buddhist monk, a major proponent of peace, a poet, and uh, known as the father of mindfulness. We did some of this at the beginning today. And um, people called him the epitome of the living Buddha. And Dr. King drew strength from him and met him, nominated him for a Nobel Prize, uh, Peace Prize. Um, in any case, Dr. King ends this speech saying, we still have a choice today, nonviolent coexistence or violent co-annihilation. In any case, these are lessons to learn. I wanna say something about two traps or three traps. One is of identity politics and cancel culture. So the ways that I'm talking about solidarity is not about um, thinking only about ideas, uh, uh, you know, identity politics, right? Uh, uh, the, these aren't just about my racial identity and following people because they're a certain racial identity. This is about having a political analysis that critiques structures of power. And I wanna say something about the trope of hate, right? As in AAPI hate and the organizers, I don't think intend this and that they also are trying to build a larger movement, the organizers of the AAPI hate movement. However, I wanna offer a critique because the language of hate individualizes the problem. It makes it seem like it's a problem of the bigotry of particular people. And it works to hide the larger structures of oppression, right, of, of institutionalized repression. And it also can fall into the trap. The third thing I wanna say is we shouldn't fall into the trap of cel being celebratory without criticality. And I wanna give two examples of this. One is the two pieces of legislation that respond to racist violence, okay? One is responding to and thinking about this notion of AAPI hate. So during COVID, right, with the rise of anti-Asian violence in May of 2021, um, there were advocates of the COVID-19 Hate Crimes Act, right? Um, hate crimes or legislation was passed in 1990 to connect illegal acts with Bigotry, bigoted motivations to give people longer sentences. And this builds on that. And so this passed by wide margins, you can see in the House overwhelmingly and also in the Senate 94 to one. And it condemns and denounces all forms of anti-Asian sentiment. Um, it calls on law enforcement officials to investigate hate crimes and it expands the collection of data and public reporting. So it was really celebrated and I show a picture of that kind of celebration as this major legislative gain and a, of the government doing something to stop the uh, violence against Asian American communities. But others critiqued it. And so we want to have criticality along with other kinds of, uh, you know, uh, not, not just simple celebration, right? And one of the criticisms is what do, did this actually do? What was new? Right? Why did this gain bipartisan support? These types of things, anti-discrimination was against the law, collecting a federal um, hate crimes was already on the books. It puts more money into policing, right? To do this, these types of investigations. And why did this pass? Why was anti-black violence not included in this explicitly, you know, even though this was also a year after the killing of George Floyd. And I wanna contrast this to the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act, right? Introduced in February of 2021, when Tyree Nichols was 
um, when, when, when Vice President Kamala Harris went to and spoke at the um, funeral of Tyree Nichols, she said that she is committing herself to pass the George Floyd Justice Act. So why is this one so much harder to pass than the COVID um, hate crime bill? You know, one of the things it does is it limits unnecessary no-knock warrants, it ends qualified immunity, and it does things that make it harder for, uh, it makes it easier to hold police accountable. And I think that because of this, because it has more teeth in it, um, it, it's harder to pass. And perhaps we can also talk about how anti-Black racism is just such an overwhelming trope in US society. But even this act, I wanna say that there's criticism of it by um, an article that was really great by uh, Dorica Purnell. And she says, for example, George Floyd wasn't even killed by a chokehold, right? We know he was killed by a knee to his neck. And so banning one tactic doesn't necessarily end police violence. And we have to be careful of these technical and tactical approaches to ending police violence. Okay, and also like the other act, it is also a carcero solution, increasing funding to police. Okay, I wanna go through my next three points on um, principles of solidarity fairly quickly um, so that I can get to q and I've been talking a really long time. Thank you for bearing with me. Um, the second major principle of solidarity for me is study and that um, we aren't just going to learn. It's, it's, it's important to reflect. It's important to engage in discussions with people to hear what their experiences are. All of this is really crucial. But we also, I think, have to study history. We need to study deeply. And so I put up different books that are really wonderful to me. Vincent Harding's There is a River That Goes Over Black History and Black Struggle in such an engaging way. This Bridge Called My Back, right, co-edited by Sheri Moraga and Gloria Anzaldúa was so formative for me. It's um, the linking, it, it really is talking about, as Chela Sandoval discusses, U.S. third world feminism. And it was linking and seeing solidarity among Black, Indigenous, Chicana, and Asian, and other uh, women of color. Um, I love Robin Kelly's Freedom Dreams, and I want to put out Monisha Dasgupta's um, study on South Asian activism. And so I just, you know, talking to a bunch of faculty, <laughs> um, but, but, but clearly I think that this is important. Okay, a third component or principle of solidarity is building relationships and thinking about collective care, and that... Yuri Kochiyama really demonstrated this. She demonstrated the importance of um, connecting people, attending to people's needs, thinking about people holistically. And many people are talking about this today, much more than they did in the 60s, for example, and the importance of building relationships, getting to know one another, accompanying one another, right? Not just getting together to come to a demonstration. And this is crucial for movement building because it offsets a lot of conflicts, right? Um, I raise up Dean Spade's widely read book and very influential, right, on mutual aid as a form of political participation in which people take responsibility for caring for one another and changing political conditions, not just through symbolic acts or putting pressure on their representatives and government, but by actually building new social relations that are more survivable. And I also think that we're trying to prefigure the social relations that we want to see in a liberatory world, right? Treating each other um, with compassion, right, being understanding, um, thinking about equity in relationships. And um, Asians for Life, Black Lives said this, solidarity is about relationship building. And I just put up this example that has been happening. Japanese American groups who won redress, right, with the 1988 Civil Liberties Act and with a couple decades long struggle for that, 
um, really in support of black reparations today and HR 40. And I put up in Nikkei Progressives, they're the top right logo, a group in Los Angeles. And they're very careful to say, we're not just trying to go to a demonstration. We wanna build relations with black activists and with black communities. Um, and, and get to know each other as people and understand each other's struggles more deeply. And the fourth principle is really that we aren't, this isn't, this is really about move, building movements for liberation. I mean, I think that's what CFA, CFA is um, about, union leadership, right? And it, it's not just one event, one post, one, you know, thing that happens going to one demonstration. It is that slow, steady, difficult work of organizing across the long haul that's going to get us to create the kinds of transformations that we want to see. And I just put up two examples of this. One is um, the solidarity among Filipino and Chicano farm workers in the farm worker strikes of the latter 60s. And there also was conflict there. And you can read Philip Veracruz's book to read about the problems that existed. Um, but there also was a solidarity that's really important and remembered. And we know that the person on the far left is Larry Itliong, a Filipino leader of the farm workers movement. And the second group I raise up is the New York Taxi Workers Alliance, uh, working in New York City today. And they're quite an amazing group, um, majority South Asian, also a lot of immigrants from Africa, the Caribbean and elsewhere, and, and many others, majority African, um, I mean, majority immigrant and majority people of color who are working as taxi drivers. They started in the 90s because taxi driving is, drivers are so vulnerable to threats of violence and to actual violence. <clears throat> and I wanna say that the Taxi Workers Alliance has been really important because as Uber flooded the New York market in the streets in 2011, they could have divided taxi drivers, yellow cab drivers from Uber drivers, but instead they united and they say, said we share a similar struggle like the IW, International Workers of the World, the Wobblies, right? And um, they've gained a lot of incredible gains for Uber drivers, um, pay increases for taxi workers, uh, debt cancellation for those medallion licenses, and um, really are a model of how we fight for labor solidarity um, across multiple languages, across multiple races and cultures in this moment of neoliberal gig economies. So I end with this. Robin Kelly had said that he keeps a sticker in his desk or a little piece of paper that says study, struggle, love. Um, that reminds him of what we need to do. And I draw from Pam Tal Lee, who's talking about radical love. And I end by asking, what is your vision of an emancipatory world? And what are the principles and strategies of solidarity that will get us to liberation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Fugino. In fact, we have some questions and I want to just bring our attention to the logistics that Jamila dropped into the chat that even though the chat is disabled, please drop your questions in the Q&A. Um, one, participant already said, thank you for this brilliant presentation. As an ethnic studies lecturer, I appreciate the depth of knowledge shared here that will benefit my students in intro to ethnic studies when we discuss the Asian American movement and even more live in detail. Big heart, heart, heart. Thank you, Dr. Fugino. Thank you. <laughs> so we have a couple questions. Uh, how do you address when other people of color, whether black or Asian, who wish to uphold the system of policing through reforms, expansion, and also uphold looking at capitalism as a solution is the first question. 
And those that continue to rely on the nonprofit industrial complex, big corporation money, as who to turn to. Yeah, this is um, such an important question, right? And it's a difficult one. You know, we can talk about abolition in the abstract, but when it comes down to having problems, what do we do? I am was am just dealing with an issue of severe mental illness um, it, with something happening where I work. And what are the options here, right? Um, how, do, how do we intervene? And because this society has so few options besides calling on the police in certain situations, it leaves people with few options. Um, I know that in the aftermath of Atlanta, right, in uh, March of 2021, the Asian American groups were flooded with all these requests. And, and um, on my campus, for example, the Asian American task force, people were, were, were flooded with questions of what we can do because Asian Americans were felt vulnerable. And there was an instinct to call the police because that's what we've been taught to do. But people were also aware that this was the post George Floyd moment, right? The movement for Black Lives was, and will calling the police keep Asian Americans safe? Will it keep Blacks safe? I mean, I think we have plenty of evidence of what it hap what happens to Black people when um, the police are called, but I would say others as well. And um, I think that what this calls on is one, really doing the kind of work that formal teaching can offer, right? And then informal education everywhere. So talking about what policing is, talking about structures of oppression, talking about um, alternatives, because people are trying to create alternatives. It's really slow. It's really difficult. There's a lot of resistance, but they are. Um, I think we can talk about what's happening in Atlanta with Cop City right now, right? I, I think that that would be a great example to teach about. And I find young people to be, at least here in California, to be very open and interested in these ideas. And I think ultimately part of this question is asking, um, you know, it's not just to teach about an example or one campaign, but to look at the structures of oppression, such as racial capitalism, that are creating these kinds of problems, right? When we talk about being radical, that means going to the root of a problem. So analyzing problems at its roots, and then that type of analysis can be used to guide the solutions we come up with. So for example, housing, we're having a huge housing crisis everywhere. What can we do to make changes? Well, one of the first things is to acknowledge the ways that right, capitalism and the market is driving up housing prices and that we aren't really going to be able to create uh, equitable housing solutions unless we address the market forces involved in it and reduce them, which is not easy. Education is really important here. Thank you so much, Dr. Fugino. Someone else has said that I want to highlight another book, Black Power, Afterlives, the Enduring Significance of the Black Panther Party, which is by you, uh, Dr. Fugino, the author. And they said that this book was incredibly influential in my ongoing work as a community worker and movement lawyer. So excellence there. Thank you uh, so much. I appreciate this kind of feedback and would love to hear more about um, the work you're doing and um, how it influenced your work, but thank you. Somebody else said that this was really amazing. Thank you. Excellent presentation, so informative. I teach cultural health and this will benefit my students when we discuss AAPI health. Uh, someone else is Fred Korematsu and others who resisted. Do you have any information about Fred? Yes, Korematsu? absolutely. Really, really important person who, um, one of the things I can say about this is World War II, Fred Korematsu, you know, everything that was happening to Japanese. And it wasn't like the anti-Japanese sentiment just started on Pearl Harbor Day. Um, it had been growing for quite a while. And from there was an anti-Japanese movement in California since 1900. And um, 
Fred Korematsu had an Italian girlfriend, and despite the fact that the U.S. was at war with Japan and Italy and Germany, right, she wasn't mass incarcerated, um, and he just didn't want to leave. He just wanted to stay with her. So he hid when it was time for Japanese Americans to be mass incarcerated, right, with those evacuation notices posted, and tried to get minor um, plastic surgery and got caught. His case went all the way of violating curfew and violating evacuation orders, went all the way to the Supreme Court. And in the 40s, he lost, but it got reopened in the 80s. And it became a really important case for um, uh, jurisprudence, for law. And I know in San Leandro in Northern California, there's a junior high, I believe. It's a school named after him. And one of the things I want to say about him is that he was rather an ordinary person, right? He wasn't an activist when he took this stance. And it wasn't a stance that was necessarily one of political protest. It was just one that he didn't want to leave, right? And that these matter, right? It doesn't always have to be this strong stance on principle that can spark home, home movements. Listen, people, we have an expert in our midst right now. Okay, use that Q&A. This is amazing. Um, another question, Dr. Fujino. This was an extraordinary presentation. Thank you so much. Do you know if Muhammad Ali had any support from the Asian community as he was opposed to the Vietnam War? I think it would be interesting to know this, especially when teaching young college students. That's a that's a good question. And I need to look into this. I am certain that there, there was, right? People like Yuri Kochiyama. This is like back, I think 1967, I think when Muhammad Ali opposes the draft and loses his heavyweight um, title and um, did, did it in part as a member of the Nation of Islam, right? And their opposition to the war. Um, and, and this is a good question. I'm going to look into it, but definitely people in the Asian American community, the Asian American movement as a whole starts around 1968. So after this already, after the stance that Muhammad Ali takes, but there were Asian American activists who were active like Yuri Kochiyama, and they absolutely would have stood with him. Thank you. Somebody mentioned the brilliant Iris Chang's research and writing about Nanking. Do you have uh, any thoughts about, yeah. for those of us who don't know what that is? Yeah, really important Japanese military massacre in China um, and, and rape and massacre. And then and, and Irish Chang, um, the late Irish Chang wrote, wrote this really important book. And there's so much that we need to study. And I will say that when I teach, I don't just teach about US or European imperialism. I also talk about Japan and the atrocities that, that they took on. And um, yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Dr. Diane Fujino, thank you for an outstanding and informative presentation. Uh, someone else said, I love how you framed anti-Asian hate and addressing the problematic issues they raise, particularly continued expansion of policing and capitalist solutions. How can we imagine solutions that center solidarity that provides an alternative to the paradigm of anti-Asian hate? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that this is harder now because that AAPI hate became the symbol. It was like Black Lives Matter became the symbol for the Black movement and Asian Americans, we got AAPI hate, right? And on one hand, the folks who started the, that um, AAPI hate, they wanted to enumerate um, and have a place where people could uh, 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 say that they were attacked, right? That there was some kind of anti-Asian, either physical attack or the majority are verbal attacks. They call it uh, hate incidents. And that is important that that get enumerated. So I applaud them for that. And if you go on their website, they are trying to do more than just enumerate um, incidences and, 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 and um, attacks. But I don't know. I think that we need to be speaking out more against it. It has gotten so easily embraced, right? And I think people who are very well-meaning aren't 
critically analyzing what that means and then the, the erasures of structural racism in that term hate, right? It just becomes individual bigotry. And it aligns so much with the kinds of tropes and philosophies of individualism that have been longstanding in this country. And so I think that we just really need to critique this, to be talking about it, to ask young people what they think about it, to be teaching about this in our classrooms. And um, the more of us that are talking about this and teaching about it, it's going to shift people's ideas. And maybe we need to get out the other forms of Asian American activism that are happening, but don't seem to take hold in the mainstream. Well, I know the narrative. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you opened my eyes because it's 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 almost like a well kept secret of how uh, connected Asian American and black were in their advocacy and activism of each others. And so you know, this question in terms of how can we imagine solutions that sense a solidarity that provides an alternative, I think is very similar to your question, if it's what is your vision of an emancipatory world, right? How do we kind of get that? Mm -hmm. uh, somebody else has asked, contemporary connections draw by Harry Kondalu, Kondabalu, and and Hassan Minaj and Desi South Asian. And so we're talking about contemporary and I know I've watched Hassan Minaj. Uh, do you, are you aware? I mean, I'm he not a millennial, great. but. <laughs> <laughs> he is great. He is so sharp. Um, just really, really um, has such an amazing way to uh, hone in on the problem that's there and name it. I'm just like, wow. And, and, and has this critique that's so important. Mm -hmm. And then as a comedian, right, draws laughs and has gotten huge um, following. Uh, so he really is, I guess, I guess in today's language an influencer, right? He can really, mm -hmm. he has this platform to really influence people, but he uses it in ways that are really substantive, not just, this is the, one of my critiques is style over substance, right? Where mm -hmm. people look good or they say something that makes people feel good. And that's what I'm trying to say when I'm saying being celebratory without criticality because I think that it's so easy we go to a talk we feel good we love it and then you think about it after and you're like what did they really say how did they really advance knowledge that's going to get us to liberation right mm -hmm. how did they change analysis that changes strategy um yeah yes. I just want to say something about Hassan Minaj I loved what he did in 38 so I don't know if you guys have seen 38 on Jeremy Lin right and um the ways that he just rose to superstardom in basketball after having been ignored so much in part, it seemed like as an Asian American and the model minority um, image was really following him and shutting him out of uh, professional basketball. Mm -hmm. And then there's a moment in which um, Jeremy Lin is waving everybody off. It's the last moment. If he makes the shot, his team wins. If he misses, they lose. And he just does it with such confidence. And I guess it was called the wave, right? They waved him off. He waved them off. He waved them off and he took it. And he took the shot and they won. And what Hassan Minaj says was that the wave off, the wave off, the wave off, that was our moment of dignity. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was just great, right? Yeah. I think it's important that you're not only having right serious literature like the books that you have shared, but also this um, piece of being a comedian, right? The comedic, being able to deliver it in different contexts so that people can hear it, so that we can kind of get access to more people. And that's what I really like about uh, comedy as well. Absolutely. And they can be sharp and they can say things that like, we as professors could never say in the classroom in the way they say it, right? Absolutely. And literature and film also, right? Really touches people in ways that sometimes research studies don't. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you for this wonderful presentation, Resources and History. Always love your work, Diane. I'm wondering if you have insight or suggestions on how to move our APIDA communities in this direction of radical solidarity with BIPOC communities, more abolitionist approaches, et cetera, even in the face of other forces increasingly moving our APIDA communities to the right. Also, 
Do you have thoughts on if and how Asian American identity that AAPA and others in the 60s helped create, whether that can still be resonant today amidst the change in demographics, heterogeneity of our APIDA communities? Thank you. Yeah, thank you, right? So the API, DESI, American kinds of uh, rubric that that were, is being referenced here. And thank you so much. Um, I One thing I don't like about webinars, right? There's not opportunity for dialogue. I shouldn't just be speaking here. This whole thing should be a dialogue. But I mean, I understand why it's not, but I, I'm just saying in that this this question and, and other ones too really, beg for dialogue, like we need to be in conversation with each other. I think people who are raising these questions also have their own thoughts and perhaps are doing their own work doing this. And I, and I wish that there was more other kinds of opportunities to hear this and maybe there can be in other ways. But um, yeah, this is not easy because the majority of Asian America are immigrants, right? And some do not have any connection to say what happened 50 years ago with the Asian American Black Power, Chicano, American Indian, other 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 movements, right? And um, and and sometimes come and are the most privileged in their homelands who are able to come, and so come with a kind of class privilege also. Um, others, of course, who are immigrants are, are, are also progressive and align with, with, with um, other groups. But I find teaching about this, I mean, I guess it just, it just is something that resonates for me. And I find that teaching about the 60s and 70s is really important because all of these kinds of ideas that I was trying to illuminate are, are, are just so, vis you know, a, a part of that movement. And sometimes it's easier to talk, teach about history than it is to teach about the present. The present gets laden with all kinds of affect and reactionary responses. But when you teach about history, people can kind of let their guard down and hear and learn. So I think that's part of what's important about teaching about history, but also always linking it to the present, right? It can't just be something that happened in the past. I wanna raise up the Chinese Progressive Association in San Francisco, they started in 72. They grew out of the Asian American movement. Um, there are other groups in Boston, but I'm thinking about the one in San Francisco just because I know it a little bit better. And people like Alex Tong, I mean, Tom has, Alex Tom, um, who was the former director of CPA, um, executive director has written a chapter in, for example, Black Power Afterlives, as well as in contemporary Asian American activism. And the work that they're doing is working with young people in San Francisco Chinatown, working with older immigrants in San Francisco Chinatown. The young people wanted to talk about queer issues um, and rights. And so they did some work with older immigrants, right? The, these are connections that you think would be very difficult and I think were very difficult, but yet the young people were pushing it and people and they had these difficult dialogues. They also did dialogues with community members around anti-Blackness and connected with Blacks and I think Hunter's point around certain kinds of campaigns that were happening there and trying to bring out uh, Chinese American support for those struggles. And I think that this is partly how it works by talking together, pushing one another. Hopefully there's a pedagogy, right, where we have an openness to hearing different ideas. It's not going to work by just saying the most radical thing um, without really engaging in the hard and critical questions that thinking people should ask. And that the more we deal with those hard questions, um, it, it, it gets becomes part of who we are in deeper ways, not just at a superficial way of just seeing abolition because it's the popular thing to say right now um, without even understanding what it means and how it works. So I really applaud the grassroots organizers who are doing this work. And I applaud, I think, teachers, right? K through 12 and university, as I think frontline workers too, who are doing this hard work, we all are. Thank you. Thank you again for the great examples of relationships that I'll be using in my teaching. Um, 
What is your take on the suggestion that Richard Aoki was allegedly an FBI informant raised several years ago, that this was raised several years ago? Yes, yes. Whew, that was a rough one for me. Um, my, bio, my book on Richard Aoki um, had just come out in, I think, April of 2012, and it was August of 2012 that... Um, the the uh, forgetting his name Rosenfeld put out the book subversives and the day before the book was published right did the video and the announcement that Richard Aoki was an FBI informant um, which was done as I've said in an opportunistic way the night before his book was was to be released he didn't come to people who knew Richard Aoki he's he he, in his own words, said that he knew this information for years. He did not um, come to people in a principled way to talk about it, to get information. He just sprung it as a gotcha moment in a way that I think helped to bring attention to his own work. And if you look at his book, which studies the FBI in at Berkeley among young youth movements, which that part of that work has been done well, but his work on racial movements, third world liberation fronts, shows a lack of understanding of race and race movements. And his first page um, talks about Richard Aoki, talks about how white bystanders were beaten up by people of color, um, third world liberation front activists. And, you know, it just, it was just so horrible in terms of um, kind of connecting the Third World Liberation Front to violence in ways that were just, I mean, just not, not accurate um, and, and problematic and kind of the innocence of whiteness. It was just such a problematic. And initially, what he put out was one FBI document that did not at all state anything, it, it didn't show his claims that Richard Aoki wasn't, it wasn't um, uh, uh, an informant. But he later, three weeks later, posted 300 pages of FBI files that were allegedly on uh, Richard Aoki as an FBI informant. And I want to point you to um, Trevor Griffney's article that looks at this, and he studies FBI um, files. And he comes to the conclusion that they're accurate um, documents and that Richard Aoki was an informant. I also want to point you to Belvin and Miriam Louis article on Richard Aoki that also analyzes all of this. And they come to the conclusion that Richard started at, um, you know, he, he voted for Nixon. He had really different politics. And perhaps when he started being an informant, he had different politics. But he grew in the movement and grew into the kinds of politics that, that he articulates. And that um, it's so interesting because I, you know, I, I, so many people have uh, that, that know him, everybody was shocked by this. And I think that folks were also surprised the degree to which the Black Panther Party came out in strong support, the former Panthers, of Richard Aoki. And they said, I know Richard. He was not an informant. It was very interesting because that could have been a moment in which there was huge Afro-Asian conflict, right? But instead, it became a moment for solidarity. Um, if Richard was an informant, then we need to deal with the truth. Um, we don't need heroes um, who, who are seen as perfect in ways. Um, I just wish that this had been dealt with in a way that was with integrity. I like that you said it, that we need to see heroes that are not necessarily perfect because we are flawed and the psychology of it is that someone can be put into, right, immersed in a culture or a context and actually come out rooting or wanting to do more for that kind of context. So even as an informant, it doesn't mean that he was against the cause 
or or what was being pushed forward and that there could have been a change. And that I think that we have all these examples of divisiveness of, right, of trying to watch, as you said here, um, the solidarity of undercutting solidarity. And that is, you know, these are the examples of undercutting solidarity and of uh, sowing divisiveness between people who have like causes. Really, really important. And can I add something to it? You're making me think of something else. So, you know, I, I am, I, 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 I oppose <laughs> informing on people completely, right? And, and I also think that we need to think about what it means to be an informant and what information that the FBI gathers, how much is it really accurate? And there are former FBI agents who have spoken to this, the ways that sometimes people who are giving the FBI information just give them things because they're getting paid and they just make things up. Sometimes these former agents said that the FBI makes things up sometimes. And also, um, uh, Belvin and Miriam Louis' point was that they saw Richard as a kind of double agent who was also gathering information. I find that a very tenuous and precarious and rather dangerous position to put yourself in. But mm -hmm. um, nonetheless, th it's really complicated. We know that FBI informants have created great harm, like in the killing, the police killing an assassination of Fred Hampton of the Panthers, right? Mm -hmm. But um, it's not clear what the impact of if Richard was an informant. So we have just a few moments left, but I'm going to try to get in about four questions. Uh, here we have, might you say more about the crucial importance of paying attention to all Asian countries when thinking about deep solidarity? It does seem that East Asian countries are often centered in US frame conversations. How can we do a better job or how do we do better and build knowledge and coalition? Absolutely. Right. And as a Japanese American, right, the kind of privileging of East Asia in the Asian American rubric and in Asian American studies. And I do think that it's something that many people think about and very intentionally try to speak about other groups. Um, when we're looking to leadership, making sure we're bringing in others. In my talks, I try to do that, even though I acknowledge this was more heavily weighed on Japanese Americans, in part because it's the kind of work that I'm doing, but um, we just, we, it, it's just such an important point of solidarity. Absolutely. Um, we, thank you. We have loved this complex and humanizing presentation. Thick Nat Han and Gandhi, my campus, Cal State LA and other universities are complicit in policing, data collection, surveillance and more. Our teaching environment is more and more dehumanized. The question is, do you think we should create a foundation study of Black thinkers, intellectuals to deeply support all BIPOC solidarity? Absolutely. <laughs> That's, that aligns with my point of study. And I had so many Black um, thinkers, right? Black intellectuals and writers on there um, because black, black Studies has and black struggle has completely informed all the other groups right asian american chicano chicana studies american indian um, in the movements from thinkers like web du bois on and we owe a great debt of gratitude and there's so much um the kinds of thinking that has greatly influenced me as i think you can see coming out of this this conversation we try to incorporate an intersectional approach to our anti-racism and social justice work. Could you say how this lens of intersectionality shows up in your work? Yeah. Um, I, 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 I mean, absolutely, on, on so many levels, right? Like um, gender is one of the things that we absolutely think about, right? So one of the things when I teach about Yuri Kochiyama and I've written about this is her, he, um, center person leadership. So it's not just borrowing on Karen Sachs. It's not just looking at kind of the writer, the thinker, the speaker, kind of the embodied in the spokesperson, spokesman, gendered leadership, but it's also about um, nurturing, caretaking, thinking about people, bringing people together, the center 
person or center woman leadership in gender terms. And we always have to be thinking about race and class. In any case, intersectionality is crucial to the work we do. It's another kind of solidarity. Is it due to political, is it due to population or social mobility or education that Japanese Americans were usually on the forefront of most social or justice movements in the US? How can these established Asian movement leaders do to support or bring in other recent or new Asians into the work? Yeah, I think if Asian, if Japanese Americans are seen at the forefront of social movements and I'm not so sure they are, but if so, I think that it is partly then it could be class based, right? It could be who's been in this country for longer. And this question connects to the previous one on the responsibilities that Japanese Americans like myself, right, have to support, promote, um, make space for, amplify the voices of, right? Other groups that are more marginalized. I mean, this is a process of like, and it's happening. And the good thing about internet and social media is it is it has the potential to be democratizing, but our movements need to be democratizing and we need to be aware of hierarchies that exist. I know that somebody has a, how can we connect this work to encourage non-members, but we'll, we're going to answer that question in a later um, place. Can you talk a bit about the use of and whether there is still a purpose for terms like third world and liberation when thinking about current struggles? Okay, <laughs> that's it. I mean, I think this is something that others can answer more. I was not a child of the 60s. I mean, I wasn't, you know, I'm, I'm, I wasn't able, I've been too young to be shaped by that, by, you know, directly, I didn't get to participate. But I'm so shaped by that movement and it so influences me. And I think because to me, that kind of third worldism implies kind of anti-imperialist um, politics that are really important. Um, but I was told my class that I teach, it's a big class and it's called Race and Resistance, mostly on Asian and black activism from the sixties to the present. And I wanted to call it third world um, activism. And my colleagues said, are you sure? Like that term has no residence with young people. So <laughs> I think I use it in ways that might not have residence with young people. But I also think that since Black Lives Matter, Movement for Black Lives, this current moment, especially in this COVID and George post-George Floyd moment, I think that more and more people are gravitating to these ideas. And whether we should be using this vocabulary or not isn't clear. But I will say that making a distinction between liberation and rights per se is an important discussion to have and we should be putting that out. Last two questions. What do you see as a major issue or theme confronting Asian Americans? Um, I, I, yeah, I pause because a, a, a theme it's hard because there's so much, right? I think that in the COVID moment, the biggest issue appears to be anti-Asian violence, which is crucial, but there's so much. There's housing, right? There's like in San Francisco, Chinatown, all these people living in single room occupancy, right? SROs and lots of gentrification impacting our communities, labor issues, why Apollo, the Asian Pacific American Labor Alliance started um, and the taxi workers and, and so many others. I mean, environment, gender yeah. issues. Yep. So we can't just drill it down to <laughs> it's one. It's hard. Yeah, there's a lot. Last one. How is JACL and its legacy viewed today? Is there consensus now or a significant split of opinion and maybe even saying what JACL means? Yes. So the, thank you. The Japanese American Citizens League, which has historically been a more moderate group, more akin to the NAACP that was more of the elite of the community who worked through establishment means um, and in the post-war and during World War II, right, encouraged Japanese Americans into the camps. And since then, they have done things. They've been in the leadership, for example, of in the 90s, um, gay and lesbian rights, right? Um, and, and a lot of other kind of work. And so I think that there's mixed views about the JACL, 
both seeing the ways that they're progressive and also seeing the ways that they do some of the work that I'm actually critiquing in this talk. Thank you so much, Dr. Fagino. And there was a lot of more accolades and applauses for your work. There was a mention of George T Taki's allegiance. And so maybe that person can reach out to you and get that response. So thank you very much for everything here. We are so much more informed than we were before. And I hope that you know what you continue to push forward our solidarity between all. Thank you so much. And thank you to everybody who stuck this through. I look forward to ongoing conversations. <laughs>